Well, good morning. Welcome to those of you here, those uh, joining us along from home. A few quick things. I don't have a lot that I need to announce or, or discuss this morning. There are certainly some things in your order of worship that you can, you can look through. But I do want to start uh, most, most significantly with a word of welcome and gratitude as, as we welcome... Uh, Dan Dance is here with us on piano this morning, and you'll hear his, his talents throughout, as well as Jason Gillette, who's back with us for, is this the second time you've been here, or third? Third, okay. Um, so they, J Jason has been with us a couple of times, including one where we were outside in the cold a little bit, I think late fall, and, and it's, a, it's a privilege to have both of you with us this morning. Thank you for being here. A reminder for those of you who are part of the Sunday Bible discussion that that is happening this afternoon, but it's that shifted time. So here in Friendship Lounge, starting at 3 o'clock, not 4. So 3 o'clock, Friendship Lounge, till 4.30. Please come along. And if you'd like to be a part of that and haven't uh, typically been, feel free to reach out to Julie, email, call, whatever. You're welcome. We just want to make sure that we have all the seating that we need set up in the room for the, the distancing that we need to do. So let Julie know if you'd like to jump in. You're welcome at any time. We'd, we'd love to have you here. For those on church council or involved in that, just a brief reminder that that church council meeting is this Tuesday. It happens this week, 7 o'clock. The link for that meeting will be in tomorrow morning's email as it is every week, or as all the links are every week for Bible studies and, and, email, and book groups and, and meetings and everything. So take a look at that. There's a little bit more in your order of worship this morning, not a ton, but I encourage you to look through that for any more detail. But I want to invite you to join as we turn our hearts to, to worship. And here's some words from John Calvin to, to think about as we do that. John Calvin writes, Nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts. Knowledge of God and of ourselves. So with that, let's turn our hearts and minds to God through the music of our prelude. The psalmist in, in Psalm 40 reminds us that 
Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God, your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. Let's be in prayer together. Almighty and ever-blessed God, from lives and circumstances that distract and, and overwhelm, we turn our hearts turn our minds, we turn our spirits to you, longing to to know your spirit among us, longing to hear your word proclaimed, longing to more fully discern the paths that you set before us, God, we gather in this place to worship, to celebrate, to rejoice, to give thanks, and to listen. So hear our praises. Speak to us as we open our spirits to yours. And know that as we gather, we do so in the name of your Son. As we share together that prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Another reading from the psalmist to share this morning. These are the first 14 verses of Psalm 139. The psalmist writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. 
For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Jesus has begun his ministry and has called two disciples, Andrew and Peter, to come and see what he will be about. As we continue now in our reading for today, from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51, listen for God's word. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee He found Peter and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. May God bless to our understanding some thing from the reading of this word. Amen. Now our reading this morning, both of them are about seeing. 
The psalmist speaks to us that nothing is hidden from God, who searches, knows, and sees us without limits of time, place, or circumstance. Now, this, for many of us, may not always be a comfortable thought to be seen in all our moments and idiosyncrasies. And we may not always show our full selves to others and cringe under the knowledge that the less appealing and sometimes yucky things we think, much less say and do, are known. Of course, we might take comfort in the idea that God sees all that in others and will hopefully smite them for it. But the psalm doesn't carry any of that in it. It isn't about fear or guilt. It is about believing and trusting that God loves us so well that in God's eyes, we belong. And so we may hear comfort and hope in this when we are going through things that we do not fully understand about ourselves or others. Now in our gospel reading, it is early days in Jesus' ministry. He has just begun to gather disciples, but there have not yet been any profound teachings or, or miracles when we hear Philip's invitation to Nathaniel to come and see. And I think it's always interesting to read the Bible and, and wait to see what, what catches your eye or, or what makes you wonder. And it would be interesting to hear from any of you what that was for you this morning as you listened and, and read the psalm and the gospel, uh, what caught at you before I made any comment? For me, I found myself tripping on Nathaniel's questions, the first being, can anything good come from Nazareth? And I tried rereading them with a variety of inflections. I think we can easily hear nothing but excitement in Philip's voice. We have found him. And we know that ultimately, Nathaniel's eyes and heart are opened. Something in him is transformed. God is revealed to him as well in the person of Jesus. But Nathaniel's initial response? Do we hear open-minded curiosity. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Or a more skeptical tone. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Or is it more a statement of a preformed opinion that doesn't expect anything good? And after he hears Jesus speak of him as if he knows him, well, is it a humble, where did you get that idea about me? Or does it sound more like, hey, you don't know me? We might hear this exchange in a variety of ways, influenced by the tone of voice that I chose to use this morning, or by something within your morning that has preoriented your thinking, or by your own reading and knowledge of the text. And again, Philip seems pretty excited, pretty convicted that this is the person he wants Nathaniel to meet and that he is more than special. He's the one to follow. And certainly, there is a sermon to be preached about our responsibility to share the good news and invite people toward it. But today, as I said, something else caught at me. And the pivotal point, if you will, that strikes me is more about how Jesus saw Nathaniel. 
for who he is and who he can be. Jesus saw Nathanael and called him an honest man. Now, should Nathanael simply trust Philip's opinion? Does he trust his own preconceived notions? That is why I appreciated this lesson today, this week, because in times such as these, we seem to fall on completely convicted yet divided sides about what is good. It seems that our sources of information and knowledge are divided as well in which one way cannot speak to the other. What we have seen just through 2020 and the beginning of this year alone has highlighted that. I do not need to rehash details here and now about these things. And of course, there are many strong opinions about many things. And one of us, any one of us, might ask, can anything good come from, and you fill in the blank. Both of our readings shed light on being known by God and having God call that out in us. And in the first creation story, you know the story. God speaks light, the sky, lands and seas, plants and trees and the sun and the stars, birds and animals, all living creatures and us into being. And in each creation, Genesis says, God saw and called it good. Can that be at the core of all that God created? Can that be at the core of us? We are not meant to be blind to what is wrong, to hurt and injustice and want. Jesus saw all of that. Jesus lived all of that. He called out the division and systems of oppression and hate. And Jesus called out faith, words and actions that brought change. A woman who argued for her daughter's sake, another for her own healing, a soldier, a father, a rich man, a leader, outcasts, and insiders. And he saw and he called out the helpers, those who loved neighbor and stranger. Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday is honored tomorrow, took part in leading a movement And yes, what he spoke of, what he protested, was racism, a broken and divided world. But he, like many others did and still do, saw something else. What should, what could, what ought, what will be. Now, I think everyone knows the I have a dream, which called out to all for change and to not reside in bitterness and hatred, to struggle together, to see into the content of character in each other. This and more is what Jesus sees and calls out in Nathaniel and all of us. Let's look at the lesson again. Did you notice that when we get to the point when Nathaniel and Jesus actually do encounter each other, no word has been spoken between them when Jesus proclaims him to be an honest person. Now today, 
we might have called his lack of deceit a lack of filter, or that he was speaking outside of political correctness. But we don't know if or what Jesus overheard. We don't know if stories about Nathaniel had been previously told to him. We don't know what opinions or warnings Jesus may have had about potential skepticism or opposition. And I suppose he could have been offended and written Nathaniel off as close-minded and then closed ranks and made his case among the others, claiming Nathaniel only as a, a cynic or thick-headed, opinionated or prejudiced or worst of all, one of them. I imagine Nathaniel, just like the rest of us, had all kinds of layers that made up the person he was, bad and good, wishes, dreams, failures, and disappointments that could have been named to identify him. But that is not what Jesus chose to see. What do we call out in each other? How do we tap into seeing what is true? One thing I do know is that we cannot stay in our categories and assumptions. We live in a world of division, categories, and taking sides. And we learn as children to sort and classify things to find similarities and differences. But a higher learning comes when we realize that we cannot take this too far, lumping others, always others, into categories and building up walls and casting names and titles around our assumptions without looking deeper. Philip didn't argue, but asked Nathaniel to let go of what he thinks he knows and come and see. If we trust that God really sees us in the way that the psalmist writes, in the way that Jesus sees Nathaniel, we can have the courage and the humility to get closer to each other to come and see what inspires the other, but maybe even more importantly, what hurts the other. To try and understand what they are afraid of. Could there be something more we need to try to see through Jesus' eyes in order to understand where we have been and how to go forward? I mean, just imagine if our own attempts to come and see, like Nathaniel, opens our eyes and hearts to seeing possibility and hope in today's circumstances. We are fragile and broken in our division. And we want to cry out, this isn't who we are. But in so many ways, we are and have been. But this isn't all we are, nor does it this speak to who we have to be. I am convinced that God sees us as so much more than any kind of category or group made up of an us that has no them in it. It matters what we see and how we perceive it, as well as how that influences what we say and do. Now, some of you, if you've been in one of the Bible studies or book groups, have heard me talk about this before, um, that, that I remember my father more than once offering up a question to us children probably at the dinner table where we would sometimes debate topics of the day 
but also if memory serves during a one-on-one -on -one conversation when I was feeling confused about something that felt really important to me. And he would ask and ask that time, does this meet with Christ's core message? I called him the other day to ask him if he remembered that. And while he said he didn't really remember particular instances that this was a part of his daily prayer. And somehow, I will say that it had sunk in early for me. And it is a gift that pops into my mind, although even sometimes when I would rather, it didn't. Does this meet with Christ's core message? And what is that? Well, Jesus' first sermon told us he had come to uplift the poor, to free the oppressed, and to open people's eyes. And then he invited us to join him. And Jesus said there are two things that express all of Scripture. To love God with your heart and soul and mind, and to love others as yourself. So how do we know how to choose rightly? How to see rightly? When we look at what we say and do, and what we when we look at what others say and do, does it meet with these things? We might ask, what good can come through these current days? Let's keep asking ourselves, what does Jesus see? Aren't we called to try to see in that way? And as Marty read earlier, John Calvin said, nearly all wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, knowledge of God and of ourselves. But we no doubt struggle to see it sometimes. Now Martin Luther wrote, during a time of great reformation, this life, therefore, is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness. Not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end but it is the road. All does not yet gleam of glory. One of the people uh, in the Thursday Bible study offered up these words that I'd like to close with. Um, it's from a devotional that she reads, and it's a brief prayer that fits so well with our Bible readings for today. And simply put, it says, come God and teach me your good lesson. May this be a prayer for us all. Amen.
That's joy. As we continue our worship together um, through our prayers, I do have several things um, to bring before us. Um, I heard from Evie Zagainer between these two services today. She called and said her great nephew, William, who is 16, has been in and out of the hospital with um, rare post-COVID re uh, reactions. And so he's been sent home, but then took another turn and is being rushed to the hospital this morning to Children's in Cincinnati. Um, there's concern for his heart and kidney damage, so she raises him up for our prayers um, and their family. Uh, Mitch Croisdale's brother, Art, uh, is, is in a coma following a couple of strokes and today is being taken off of the ventilator. Uh, Midge has traveled to have a few moments at his uh, side today. And so we pray for Midge, um, Art's wife, Paula, their family in this time of, of waiting and grief. But we also, I raise up to you prayers for Midge's long drive home tomorrow and all that that will be. So praying safe travels and peace of mind as it can be. Um, Tom Chalimsky had called this morning um, and said that they were headed to the hospital there at the ER now um, with his mother and they suspect that she may have broken her hip, so uh, we offer that um, to the body for prayer and to God. But there is a joy. Um, Sandy Baylor, who we've been praying for this week for her sister, Jenny, uh, who is a hospital administrator. She'd been hospitalized with COVID, um, but she's home now and experiencing some recovery. So gratitude for that. Are there any other joys or concerns that any of you would like to give voice to? Okay. Let's pray. Merciful God, who searches, knows us, and loves us through all these things, through times of chaos and lack of understanding and through grief and worry, through joys and connections, through times when we are breaking apart and times when we are coming together. We are humbled and inspired by the truth we find in you, by the way that you enter into our lives, and so we trust you to speak truth into our hearts, to speak compassion into our words, to speak peace into our actions, and hope and healing into our way forward. And so we offer our lives, our dreams, our, our hope, our loves, our concerns, as we remember all these things we have spoken and now as we also pray in silence of the people and things that reside in our hearts. For the prayers that we have offered now, we are grateful that you hear us. Lord Jesus, call out in us what is good, and may that be our way this week. May we see as you see all that we are created to be, loving you and what you love. Amen. And may the God who Sees accompany you this week, and may we pause with humbled hearts to say, Come, God, and teach us your good lesson beyond this moment and into this week. Amen.